Chapter Eight of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Eight: The Blood of Kings. There never was, and there isn't now, anything elusive about the Hill Division, unless you get to talking about the mileage. When you strike the mileage, you strike deep water, and the way of it is this. Most things that are big and vital and enduring develop with the years to their own maturity, and with maturity comes perfection, as nearly as anything is perfect. When the last rail that proclaimed man's mastery of the Rockies and the Sierras, an accomplished fact, was spiked to the ties with much ceremony and more eclat, to say nothing of the somewhat wobbly and uncertain blows with which the silk-hatted, very important national personage performed this crowning act, while the rough and readies whose toil and sweat and grime and blood had bought the miles the orators were eulogizing, being no longer of the elect, looked on from a respectful distance. When all this was done, the Hill Division, even then, was no more than the rough draft of a masterpiece. In the years that followed came the pruning and the changes, the smoothing and the toning down, tunnels bored through the mountain sides, lessened the grades, and lopped off winding miles around projecting spurs. Trestles with long embankment approaches added their quota to this much to be desired result, while in the foothills, instead of circling around and around to the right and the left and the left and the right of an endless procession of buttes, the buttes themselves came to be bisected with mathematical precision. All told, many miles, very many miles, have been wiped out in this fashion. The elusive part of it is that, measured in the dollars and cents paid by the tourists for transportation and the shippers and consignees for freight halls, the line is just as long as ever it was. And it would appear that a good deal of money had been spent with nothing to show for it. But then against this is the fact that the directors down east were never rated as imminent or near imminent subjects for a lunacy commission. The mileage is elusive. Let it go at that. For the rest, the right-of-way from Big Cloud, the divisional point, just east of the mighty blue-blurred snow-capped range that towers to the skyline north and south, from there to the rolling, undulating country that reaches west from the base of the Sierras, the Hill Division is without question the most marvelous piece of track ever conceived by man, and it stands a perpetual and enduring monument to the brains and the genius, ay, and the manhood, too, of those who built it. Such is the Hill Division. You who know the Rockies know it for the grandeur of its scenery, know it for the glory of its conquest over obstacles seemingly insurmountable. But there is another side that you may not know aside that the maps and plans and blueprints and the railroad folders and the windows of the observation cars big as they are do not show and that side is the human side it is full of tears and laughter full of sorrow and joy of dangers and death and mistakes and triumph its history would fill many pages but it is a history that will never be written for the generals and the rank and file of its army have fought their battles without the blare of trumpets, have done their work and their duty as they saw it, simply and with few words, without thought of personal profit, and much less of fame. They tell their own stories amongst themselves, and they hold in honor those entitled thereto, which is a meed beyond any recognition of governments or kings or principalities, because it is the tribute of man to man without glamour and without pretense. If you are a man as they measure men, they will tell you the stories too. And if you care to smoke, they will offer you their black plugs with the heart-shaped tin tags that their favorite manufacturer embeds therein, and further, they will hand you their clasp knives with which to slice it. If you are wise, you will understand that you are honored above most men, and you will be becomingly humble and will listen. But if this, through circumstance and misfortune, has never been your lot, then, here and there, inadequately and meagerly, you may run across in print a stray breath from the Hill Division. This is a case in print, the story of King Gilleen. Gilleen was a man you would never pass in a crowd without turning your head to look at him a second time, 
not even in a big crowd, for nature had dealt with Galeen generously, or otherwise, whichever way it pleases you best to consider it. He had red hair of a shade that might be classified as brilliant, but which Regan, the master mechanic, described in metaphor. Said Regan, You could see that head a mile away, on the other side of a curve in a blizzard at night when he points it out of the cab window. You'll never get Galeen on the carpet because his head lights out, what? Certainly, at any rate, Galeen's hair was undeniably red. He had blue eyes and a very small nose, which, for all that, was next to his hair the most prominent feature he possessed. Small noses with a slight upcount to the tip are pronounced, mere size to the contrary. His face was freckled, and so were his hands. Also, he was no small chunk of a man, not so very tall, but the shoulders on him were something to envy if you were friendly with him, or to respect if you were not. That was Gilleen, all except the fact that he admitted with emphasis to the blood of some wild Irish race of kings coursing through his veins. This last point was never established. Everyone took Gilleen's word for it, that is, everyone but Regan, who was Irish himself, and more pertinent still, Gilleen's direct superior. On this point, Regan, who was never adverse to doing it, could get a rise out of Gilleen quicker than the bite of a hungry trout. By Christmas! Gilleen would sputter on such occasions. I'll have you know I'm no liar, and if it were not for the missus and the six kids— Here Gilleen would always stop to count, owing to a possible arrival since the last clash, realizing that any slip would be instantly and mercilessly turned against him by the grinning master mechanic. If it were not for them, Regan, you listen to me. I'd bash your face and then ram the measly job you gave me down your throat. I would that. Well— Regan would return, when you get to sitting on a dinky gilded throne, sunk to the ground sheet in the bogs though it will be, I'll ask no more nor as much from your hands as you get from mine, which is more than your deserts. Who but me would do as much for you? You ought to be back wiping. I've thought some seriously of it, hm? Six, is it now? Well, it's a grand race whereupon Gilleen would say hot words and say them fervently while he shook his fist at the master mechanic. "'I'll show you some day, Regan,' was his final word. "'I'll show you what kind of a race it is, and don't you forget it!' All of which is neither very interesting nor in any degree witty. It simply shows where Gilleen's nickname came from. Everybody on the division called him King, not to his face. They do now, but they didn't then. Queer the way a little thing like that acts on a man sometimes. Gilleen was well enough liked in a way, but no one ever really took him seriously in anything. Associate a man with a joke, and henceforth and forever after, usually the two are inseparable. He may have had aspirations, ambitions, what you will, but he is given no credit for having them. With Gilleen it was just that way. Just Gilleen. King Gilleen. With a grin. The Lord only knows what possessed Gilleen to adhere with such stout-hearted loyalty to his ancestors. You may put an interrogation mark after that last word, if you like. It began with perhaps no more than a boyish boast when his official connection with the system was no further advanced than to the degree of holding down the job of assistant boiler washer in the roundhouse. The more they guyed him, the more stubbornly he stuck. It was a matter worth fighting for, and Gilleen fought. He threw pounds, reach, and other advantages to the winds, and took on anybody and everybody. By the time he had moved up to firing, he had fought all who cared to fight, who were not a few, and then, following that in the due course of promotion, he got his engine. He had, by blows, not argument, established his assertion outwardly, at least. At a safe distance, the division, remembering broken noses and missing teeth and no longer denying him his royal blood, gave him his way, smiled tolerantly in self-solace, and called him nutty. Regan, of course, still guyed, but Regan was master mechanic. Not that he did it by virtue of the immunity his official position afforded him. He never gave that a thought. He did it because he was Regan, and Regan was built that way. He could no more forego the chance of a laugh or an inward chuckle than he could forego the act of breathing and live. A joke is a joke, just fun with him, that was all. But with Gilleen it was different. 
Being unable to use his fists as was his wont, and being possessed of no other safety valve, the pressure mounted steadily until it registered a point on his mental gauge that spoke eloquently of trouble to come. And so matters stood when, following a rather dull summer, the fall business opened with a rush and a roar. Things moved with a jump, and the rails hummed under a constant stream of traffic, east and west. Here, at least, was no joke. A rush on the hill division, single track, through the mountains, never was. A month of it, and everyone from car tink to superintendent began to show the effects of the strain. It was double up everywhere, extra duty, extra tricks. The dispatchers caught their share of it, and their eyes grew red and heavy under the lamps at night, and the heads of the day men ached as they figured a series of meeting points that had no beginning and no end, but bad as it was for the men on the keys it was worse for some of those in the cabs schedules went to smash perishables and flyers were given the best of it the rights of the rest were the sidings it was a case of crawl along sneak from one to the other with layout after layout until the ordinary length of a day's duty tapped over into fifteen-hour stretches and sometimes to twenty-four Sleep, what they could get of it, the engine crew snatched bolt upright in their seats while they waited for number one's headlight to shoot streaming out of the east, or nodded until roused by the roar and thunder of a flying freight, cars and cars of it crammed with first-class ratings, streaking east, as it hurtled by with insolent disregard for every mortal thing on earth. Maybe Gilleen got a little more of it than anyone else on the throttles, maybe he did, or maybe he didn't. Galeen thought he did, anyhow, and naturally he put it down to Regan's account. Regan was head of the motive power department of the Hill Division. There was no one else to put it down to. It was Regan or imagination. Galeen, not being strong on imagination, did not debate the question. He let it go at Regan. In from one run, shot out on another, that was Galeen's schedule. The little woman in the house uptown off Main Street got to be mostly a memory to Galeen, and as for the six brick-headed scions of his kingly race, he came to wonder if they really existed at all. Things boomed and hummed on the hill division, and while everybody on it snarled and swore and nagged at each other, as weary, worn-out, dropping-with-fatigue men will do, the smiles broadened on the lips and spread over the faces of the directors down east as they rubbed their palms beneficently, expectantly, scenting extra dividends and soaring stock. It was noon one day when Gilleen, with a trailing string of slewing freights behind him, pulled into the big cloud yards, uncoupled, backed down the spur, crossed the table, and ran into the roundhouse. As he swung from the gangway, Regan came hurrying in through the engine doors of Gilleen's pit from the direction of headquarters, and walked up to the engineer. Gilleen! said he briskly. You'll have to take out special 83. 1603 is ready with a full head on pit two. What's that? snapped Gilleen. Take out a special now. You know damn well I'm just in from a run. I'm tired. You'll rub it in once too often, Regan. We're all tired, aren't we? returned the master mechanic tartly. Do you think you're the only one? As for rubbing it in, you'd better draw your fire, my bucko. There's no rubbing in being done except in your eye. Anyhow, that's enough talk. Special 83's carded on rush orders from down east, and she's been in here for an hour now. Well, why don't you let the crew that brought her in keep going, then? snarled Gilleen. It was a fool question, and he knew it. But as he had said, he was tired, and his temper, never angelic, was now pretty well on edge. Regan glared at him a moment angrily. Regan, too, was tired and irritable, harassed beyond the limit that most men are harassed. The demand upon the motive power department for men and engines had kept him up more than one night trying to figure out a problem that was well-nigh impossible. "'Let him go on,' he snorted. "'You know well enough I haven't anything on the Prairie Division men. You know that. What do you say it for, then, hmm? You're the first man in, and you go out first. It strikes me I'm generally the first man in these days,' retorted Gilleen angrily. "'And I'm sick of getting the short end of it. I guess I won't go out this time.' It took a breathing spell before the master mechanic could explode adequately. "'You call yourself a railroad man?' he flung out furiously. "'What are you whining about? Every man's got his shoulder to the wheel and pushing without talk. We haven't got any room here for quitters. I guess that blood of yours that you're so pinhead-brained about—' Regan did not finish. 
With a bellow of rage, the red-haired engineer went at the other like a charging bull, and the master mechanic promptly measured his length on the roundhouse floor for a wallop on the head that made him see stars. Regan scrambled to his feet. His heart was the heart of a fighter, even if his build was not. Straight at Galeen he flew, and the passes and lunges and jabs he made, while the engineer played on the master mechanic's paunch like a kettle drum, and delivered a second wallop on the head as a plaster for the first, are historic only for their infinitesimal coefficient of effectiveness. It is unquestionably certain that the master mechanic then and there would have proceeded to make up for some of his lost sleep, at least if Gillian's fireman and a wiper or two hadn't got in between the two men just when they did. Gillian was boiling mad. Will, he bawled, got anything more to say about quitting or the other thing? I guess I won't go out this time, what? Regan was equally mad, and as he felt tenderly of his forehead where a lump was rapidly approximating the formation of a goose egg, he grew madder still. You won't go out, won't you? he roared. Well, I guess you will, and what's more, you'll go out now and get your time. I'd fire you, understand? You bet, said King Gilleen, and that's all he said. He looked at the master mechanic for a minute, but didn't say anything more, just laughed and walked out of the roundhouse. Naturally enough, the story got up and down the division, and everybody talked about it. With their rough and impartial justice, they put both men in the wrong, but mostly Gillian for insubordination. The affront Gillian had suffered was not so big and momentous, a long way from being the vital thing in their eyes that it was in his. Gillian was just nutty on that point. That was all there was to it. Regan's judgment had been bad, and the moment he had seized for his thrust and fling was by no manner a means of psychological one. But... For all that, Gillene had no business to strike the master mechanic. He had got what was coming to him. That was the verdict. He was out and out for good. It was pretty generally conceded that it would be a long while before he pulled a throttle on the Hill Division again. What sympathy the engineer got, for he got some, wasn't on his own account. It was on account of his family, not the ancestral end of it, however. Six kids and a wife do not leave much change out of a paycheck, even when it's padded by overtime. Six kids and a wife with no paycheck is pretty stiff running. Galeen was too hot under the collar to give a thought to that when he marched out of the roundhouse that noon. But it wasn't many hours, after he had put in a few to make up for the sleep he hadn't had during the preceding weeks, that the problem was up to him for consideration with a vote for adjournment for once ruled out as not in order. Mrs. Gillene may or may not have shared her spouse's opinions on the subject of his illustrious descent. If she did, she never put on any airs about it. Washing and dressing and cooking was about all one woman could manage for a household as big as hers. That's what she said, anyway, whenever anyone asked her about it. At one glance at the red-headed brood that filled the front yard and swung on the front gate, whose hinges creaked in loud and bitter protest, was enough to preclude any dispute on that score. Just a little bit of a woman she was physically, but bigger practically than the whole core of leading lights in social and domestic economy, which, come to think of it, is damning Mrs. Gillene with faint praise, whereas too much couldn't be said for her. However, let that go. Mrs. Gillene was practical, and she had the matter up to the engineer almost before he had the sleep washed out of his eyes. No nagging, no reproach, nothing of that kind. Mrs. Gillene wasn't that sort of a woman. King or not, Gillene might have been. Kate Gillene was a queen. Not in looks, perhaps, but a queen, that's flat. A fine woman is the finest thing in the world. And if that were said a little more often than it is, maybe things generally wouldn't be any the worse for it, which is not a plank in the platform of the suffragettes, though it may sound like it. Michael, said she, you rowed with Mr. Regan, and he fired you. Will he take you back? Gillene lowered the towel to his chin to catch the dripping water from his hair. He had just buried his head in the wash bowl the minute before and looked at his wife. I wouldn't ask him, Kate, he said shortly. Mrs. Gillene was proud, too, but for all that she sighed. Oh, what will you do then, Michael? She asked. I don't know yet, little woman. Some of the others will give me a job, I guess, 
Maybe I'll try the train crews. I'll hit him up for something, anyway. Oh, but there's ever so much less money in that. Mrs. Gilleen's tones were judicial, not plaintive. I know it, returned Gilleen, but it'll tide us over and keep the steam up till we get a chance to pull out for somewheres where a man can get an engine without a grinning fool of a master mechanic to double-cross him with the worst of it every chance he gets. I hope it will all come out right, said Mrs. Gilleen a little wistfully. It will, Gilleen assured her. Don't you worry, I'll get a job right away as soon as I've had a bite. It came easier even than Gilleen had figured it would such as it was, and it was about the last job Gilleen had thought of as a possibility. Things have a peculiar way of working themselves out sometimes, and curiously enough, by means which on the surface are, more often than not, apparently trivial and inconsequent. Certainly if Gilleen, on his way to the station that morning, had not run into Gleason, the yardmaster, why then... But he did. Call boys kind of scarce around your diggings since yesterday, ain't they, Gilleen? was Gleason's greeting. Yes, said Gilleen. I'm out. Uh, see you're headed for the station, remarked Gleason tentatively. Going down to patch it up? No, answered Gilleen with a hard ring in his voice. The no was emphatic. Gleason stared at the engineer for a minute, then took a bite from his plug, and the motion of his head might have been a nod of understanding, or merely a wrench or two to free his teeth from the black strap in which they were embedded. No, said Gilleen again. I'm not. I'm going down for another job. What kind of a job? inquired Gleason. Any kind from anyone that will put me on, except Regan. Gleason thought of his choked yards. The rush had in no way overlooked him. Men, men that knew a drawbar and a switch handle from a hunk of cheese, were as scarce in his department as they were in any of the others. Yards, he queried and blinked. Do you mean it? demanded Gilleen, taking him up short. Oh, sure I mean it. You're on, said Gilleen. Night switchman, amplified the yardmaster. You can begin tonight. All right, I'll be on deck, agreed Gilleen. And thanks, Gleason. I'm much obliged to you. Meh grunted Gleason. They ain't much of a stake compared with an engine, but it's yours and welcome. It was true. Comparatively, it wasn't much of a stake, and even the first night of it was enough to throw the comparison into strong and bitter relief. If anything would have put a finishing touch on Gilleen's feelings and anent the master mechanic, it was that first night on yard switching. That and, of course, the nights that followed. It wasn't so much the work, though that was hard enough, and being green, the engineer made about twice as much for himself as there was any need of. It was uh, not to be denied tendency of his eyes to stray toward the roundhouse every time a gleaming headlight showed on the turntable. If Gilleen had never known before how much he loved an engine, he knew it in those dark hours while he swung a lantern from the roofs of a freight string or hopped the footboard of the switcher. Up and down the yards, from dusk till dawn, to the accompaniment of the wheezing, grunting, coughing, foreshortened apology for a shunter, the clash of brake beams, the hump and rattle, staccato diminuendo, as a line of boxcars grumbled into motion, didn't take on any roseate hues from the angle Gilleen looked at it, nor did an occasional ten-wheeler, out or in, sailing grandly past him with impudent airs help any either. Gilleen's language became as freckled as his face and hands and as fiery as his head. Even that grand old Irish race from which he sprang, that wild and untamed breed of kingly sires, paled into significance. Gilleen was more occupied with Regan. What he thought he said, and said it aloud without making any bones about it, said it through his teeth with his fists clenched. Perhaps it was just as well Gilleen was on nights, for ordinarily the master mechanic had nothing to bring him around the yards, shops, or roundhouse after sundown. Regan's evenings being spent with Carleton, the super, a pipe and a game of Pedro upstairs over the station of the superintendent's office next door to the dispatcher's room. Just as well for both their sakes, for Regan's physically... For Galeen's, because uh, little fond of his job as he was, there were certain necessities that even little Mrs. Galeen, with all her practicability and economy, could not supply without money. Anyway, the days went by, and the two men did not meet, 
though Gillane's orations got around to Regan's ears fast enough. The master mechanic only laughed when he heard them. Gillane, said he, is like the parrot that said sick em, and said it once too often. <laughs> he talks too much. If he'd kept his mouth shut, I'd have given him his run back after a lay off to teach him manners. As it is, if he likes switching, let him keep at it. Maybe by the time he's tired, the throne of his ancestors will be ready for him. What? All this was enough to spell ructions in the air, and ordinarily the division to a man would have hung mildly expectant on the result of the final showdown. But the Hill division just then wasn't hankering for anything more to liven it up. It was getting all of that sort of thing it wanted, and a little besides. Attending strictly to business was about all it could do, a trifle beyond what it could do, and everything else was apart. The boom showed more signs of increasing than it did of being on the wane. There wasn't any let up anywhere. Things sizzled. It never rains, but it pours, they say. And that's one adage, at least, that the railroad men of Big Cloud and the town itself, for that matter, will swear by to this day. There are a few things that Big Cloud remembers vividly and with astonishing minuteness for detail, but the night the shops went up tops them all. When it was all over, they decided that a slumbering forge fire in the blacksmith shop was at the bottom of it. Not that anyone really knew or knows now. But they put it down to that because it sounded reasonable and because there wasn't anything else to put it down to. However, whether that was the cause or whether it wasn't, on one point there was no possible opening for an argument, and that was the effect and the result. If you knew Big Cloud in the old days, you know where the shops were and what they looked like. If you didn't, it won't take a minute to tell you. You could see them from the station platform across the tracks far up at the west end of the yards, and they looked more like a succession of barns nailed on to each other than anything else, except for the roofs which were low and flat, the buildings being all one-storied. What with the quarters of the boilermakers, the carpenters, the machinists, and the fitters, the old shops straggled out over a goodly length of ground, and a grimy, ramshackle, dirty, blackened, godforsaken-looking structure it was. Today, thanks to that fire and the big strike when it came along, there's a modern affair of structural steel, and the rest is but a memory. However... Night in the mountains in the fall comes early, and by nine o'clock on the night the fire broke out, it had shut down pitch dark. Nothing showed in the yards but the twinkling switch lights, the waving lamps of the men, and an occasional gleam from the shunter's headlight when it shot away from the end of a boxcar. Across the tracks the station lights were like fireflies, and there was a glimmer or two of showing from the roundhouse. Apart from the fact that a pretty strong west wind was brushing the yards, if you could count that as anything apart, there was nothing out of the ordinary, everything was going on as usual, when suddenly, without warning, a wicked fang of flame shot skyward, then another higher than the first. It was answered by a yell from the yard men, caught up in the roundhouse, and then the switcher's whistle shrieked the alarm. Another minute and everything with steam enough to lift a valve joined in. Dark forms began to run in the direction of the shops, and then the bell in the little English chapel uptown took a hand in the clamor. The alarm was unanimous enough and general enough when it came. There was never any doubt about that, but the fire must have got a pretty stiff start before it broke through the windows to fling its first challenge at the railroad men. Gillen and the rest of the yard crew were on the run for the scene when Gleason's voice bawling over the din halted them. "'Clean out there, four and five, and get them down to the bottom of the yards and look lively,' he yelled. "'Leave that string of gondolas on six till the last. Jump now, boys. Eat them up!' Oil-spattered floors and oil-smeared walls are a feeding ground for a fire than which there is no better. The flame tongues leaped higher and higher, throwing a lurid glare down the yards, and throwing, too, as the wind caught them up and whirled them in gusts, a driving rain of sparks that threatened the long, dark lines of rolling stock, for the most part choked to the doors with freight, freight enough to total a sum in claim checks that would blanch the cheeks of the most florid director on the board of the Transcontinental. With Gleason in command, Gillen and his mates went at their work heads down. There wasn't anything fancy or artistic about the way they banged those cars to safety. There wasn't time to be fussy. Behind them, the south end of the shops was already a blazing mass. 
The little switcher took hold of first one string, then another, shook it angrily for a minute as her exhaust roared into a quick crackle of reports, and the drivers spun round like pinwheels, making the steel fly fire. Then with a cough and a grunt and a final push, she would snap the cars away from her, and the string would go sailing down the yard to bump and pound to a stop with an echoing crash into whatever might be at the other end. There was a car or two the next morning, with front ends and rear ends and both ends at once, that looked as though they had been in a cyclone, and there was a claim voucher or two put through for a consignment of nursing bottles and a sewing machine. Not that the two necessarily go together, but no matter, they did then. Anyway, the record the yardmen made that night is the record today, and in no more than ten minutes there wasn't a car within three hundred yards of the shops. But while the yard crew worked, others were not idle. Regan and Carleton, both of them, had caught the first flash from the windows of the super's room, and they were down the stairs, across the yards, and into the game from the start. Joined by the night men and the ostlers and the wide-eyed call boys, they tackled the blaze. By the time they had dragged and coupled the fifty-foot hose lengths, it took five lengths, along the tracks from the roundhouse, the needle on the stationary's gauge, luckily not yet quite dead from the day's work, and whose firebox Clarahoo, the turner, now crammed with oil-soaked packing, began to climb, and they got an uncertain weekly stream playing, uncertain, but a stream, after that things went with a rush, both ways, the fire and the fight. From the gambling hells and the saloons, from the streets and their homes came the population of Big Cloud, the Polacks, the Russians, the railroad men, the good and the bad whites, the half-breeds, and the local fire brigade. Two more streams they ran from the roundhouse, and that was the limit. The rest of the hose was liquid rubber somewhere under the blaze. Regan, with a bitter hard look on his face, for the shops were Regan's, was everywhere at once, and what man could do he did. But inch by inch the flames were getting the better of him. The yards were as bright as day now, and the heat was driving the circle of fighters back stubbornly as they fought to hold their ground. It looked like a grand slam for the fire with the four aces in one hand. Twice Regan had been on the point of ordering the men to the roof, and twice he held back. Once he had even ordered a ladder planted, only to order it away again. The building was only wood and old, and the roof was none too strong at best. But now under and supported by the roof of the fitting shop, put in a month before in lieu of the old system of jacking and blocking by hand, making the risk a hundredfold greater, were the heavy steel girders and hydraulic traveling cranes that whipped the big moguls like jack-straws from their wheels, preparatory to stripping them to their bare boiler shells. Regan shook his head. It was asking a man to take his life in his hands. For a moment he stood a little apart in front of the crowd, and just behind the nozzle end of one of the streams. Again he measured the chances, and again he shook his head. "'I can't ask a man to do it,' he muttered. "'But we ought to have a stream up there. It's—' "'Why don't you take it there yourself, then?' The words came sharp and quick from his elbow, stinging hot like the cut of a whiplash. It was King Gilleen, red-haired, blue-blooded, freckle-skinned Gilleen. The master mechanic whirled like a shot, and for a minute the two men stared into each other's eyes, stared as the leaping flames sent flickering shadows across the grim set features of them both, stared at each other face to face for the first time since that noon in the roundhouse days before. "'Why don't you take it yourself, then?' said Gilleen again, and his laugh rang hard and cold. "'Ha-ha! <laughs> you ain't a quitter, are you? There's nothing wrong with your blood, is there? If you're not afraid, come on!' As he spoke, he stepped forward, pushed the men from the nozzle, and looked back at the master mechanic. Regan's lips were like a thin white line. Gilleen laughed out again, and it carried over the roar and the crackle of the flames, snapping timbers, the hiss and spit of the water, the voices of the crowd. Put up the ladder! It was Regan's voice, deadly cold. Lash a short end around the nozzle, and stand by to pass it up. He was at the foot of the ladder almost before they got it in position, and the next instant began to climb. Like a flash, Gilleen, surrendering the fire hose temporarily, sprang after him, and up. It wasn't far. The shops were low, just one story high, and both men were on the roof in a minute. Gilleen caught the coiled rope they slung him from below, and together he and the master mechanic hauled up the writhing, spluttering hose. 
A shower of sparks and a swirling cloud of smoke enveloped them as they stood upright and began to advance. It cleared away, leaving them silhouetted against the leaping wall of flame a few yards in front of them, and a cheer went up from the throats of the crowd below. Not a word passed between the two men. Foot by foot they moved forward, laying the hose in a line behind them to lessen the weight in the side pull that at first had called forth all their strength to direct the play of the stream. Foot by foot they went forward, closer and closer, perilously close, to the blistering, scorching, seizing mass, for neither of them would be the first to hold back. High into the heavens streamed the great yellow-red forks of angry flame, and over all, like a gigantic canopy, rolled dense volumes of grey-black smoke. Came at the two men spurting fiery tongues, stabbing at them, robbing them of their breath, mocking at their puny might. Another stepped forward, and Regan reeled back. One hand went to his face, and the nozzle almost wrenched itself from the engineer's grasp. "'It's a grand race!' laughed Gilleen, but the laugh was more of a gasping cough and the cough came from cracked and swollen lips. "'It's a grand race, Regan, and the blood!' With a choking sob, Regan steadied himself and seized hold of the nozzle again. They held where they were now. It was the fire, not they, that was creeping forward, pitilessly, inevitably, licking greedily at the tarred roof until it grew soft beneath their feet, and the bubbles puffed up and formed and broke. A cry of warning came from below, and with it, came the ominous rending groan of yielding timbers. It came again, the cry, and rang in Gilleen's ears almost without sense. He could scarcely see. His eyes were scorched and blinded. His lungs were full of the stinging smoke, choking full. Beside him Regan hung, dropping weak. "'Get back! For God's sake, get back!' It was Carlton's voice. "'Do you hear?' shouted the super frantically. "'Get back! The roof is sagging! Run for—' Like the roar of a giant blast, as a park of artillery belches forth in deafening thunder, there came a terrific crash, and, fearful in its echo, a cry of horror rose from those below. Where there had been roof a foot in front of the men was now nothingness. Gillian, with a shout, as he felt the edge crumble under him, flung himself backward, and as he leaped he snatched at Regan. His fingers brushed the master mechanic's sleeve, hooked, slipped, and he struck on his back a full yard away. He reeled to his feet like a drunken man and dug at his eyes with his fists. Over the broken edge of the shattered roof, hanging into the black below, was the dangling hose. But Regan was gone. Weak, spent, exhausted, the master mechanic, unequal to the exertion of Gilleen's leap, had pitched downward, clutching desperately, feebly, vainly as he went. Regan was gone, and twenty feet somewhere below he lay. Gilleen staggered forward. It was the far end of the beams that had given way, and the six or seven yards of the roof that had fallen still separated him from the heart of the blaze. The advancing flames lighted up a scene of wreck and ruin below in the fitting shop. Girders and steel tees and cranes and tackles, splotches of roofing, shattered timbers, lay over the black looming shapes of the monster engine shells blocked on the pit. Regan! he called, and again, Regan! Regan! Above the roaring crackle of the fire, above the surging, pounding noises that beat mercilessly at his eardrums, faint, so faint it seemed like fancy, a low moan answered him. Once more it came, and upon Gilleen surged newborn strength and life. He began to drag at the hose with all his might, dropping it foot by foot over the jagged edge of the roof until it reached well down to the snarled and tangled wreckage below and then a mighty yell went up from a hundred throats, and again, and again, Gilleen, King Gilleen, King, King! There was no jibe now, just a bursting cheer from the full hearts of men. King! they roared, and the shout swelled, but Gilleen never heard them as they crowned him. King he was at last in the eyes of all men, a king that knows no blood, nor race, nor throne, nor retinue. Gilleen was lowering himself down the hose. It was a question of minutes. The fire was sweeping in a mad wave across the intervening space. The engineer's feet touched something solid, and he let go his hold of the hose, and stumbled, lost his balance, and pitched forward, striking on his head with a blow that dazed and stunned him. Mechanically, he understood that what he had taken for flooring was a workbench. He got to his feet again, the blood streaming from his forehead, and shouted, this time there was no answer. 
staggering falling tripping stumbling he began to search frantically amid the debris the air was thick with the smothering smoke hot stifling drying up his lungs he began to moan crying the name of the master mechanic over and over again crying it as a man cries out in delirium bits of oil-soaked waste and wads of packing catching from the glowing cinders were blazing around his feet the onrush of the flames swept a blighting wave upon him that sent him reeling back scorching blistering the naked skin of his face and hands again he fell a great sheet of flame leapt high behind him held for an instant and then the dull red glow settled around him again but in that instant just a little to the right pinned under a scantling half hidden by a snarled knot of roof and girders was the master mechanic's form on his knees groping with his hands gilleen reached him and began to tear furiously savagely madly at the timber that lay across regan's chest he moved it little by little every inch tasking his weakening muscles to the utmost blackness was before him he could no longer see he could no longer breathe hot nauseating fumes strangled him and sent the blood bursting from his nostrils he tried to lift regan's shoulders and sank down beside the master mechanic instead feebly he raised his head there came the splittering crash of glass a rushing stream tore through a window hissed against the boiler shell above him and glancing off lashed a cold spray of water into his face the window three yards to the window he was up again and pulling at the dead weight of the master mechanic just three yards he cried like a child as he struggled and the tears ran down his cheeks in streams a foot two feet three two more yards to go axes were swinging now in front of him shouts reached him half the distance was covered but he had gone to his knees everything around was hot it was all fire and hell and madness a yard and a half only a yard and a half alone he could make it easily enough and maybe regan was dead anyhow alone and there was safety and life alone and then he laughed it's a grand race regan a grand race he sobbed hysterically and his grip tightened on the master mechanic and he won another foot and another and another a black form wavered before him he felt an arm reach out and grasp him then he tottered swayed and dropped inert unconscious they got him out and they got regan out and they got the fire out by the time there wasn't much left to burn and after a week or two both men got out of the hospital that's about all there is to it, except that Gilleen's red head now decorates the swellest cab on the division, and that he never fought for his title after that night. He never had to. Though, if you feel like questioning it, uh, you can still get plenty of fight for all that. Any of the boys will accommodate you any time. Regan isn't an artist as a pugilist, but even so it is unwise to take risks on scientific men by lucky flukes have handed knockouts to their betters if galeen says so that's enough whether it's so or not what regan will fling at you it's pretty good blood eat it no matter what kind it is well then hm? end of chapter eight Chapter 9 of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 9 Marley. There are some men they remember on the Hill Division. Marley is one of them. And his story goes back to the days before the fire wiped out what the strike had left of the old rambling shops at the western end of the Big Cloud yards back to the time when Royal Carleton was young in the superintendency of the division, when Tommy Regan, squat, fat, and paunchy, was master mechanic, and Harvey was division engineer, and Spence was chief dispatcher, when the big fellows, as they were called, wrestled with the rough of it, shaking the steel down into a permanent right-of-way, shackling the Rockies, welding the west and the east. Marley was not a big fellow in either sense of the word. Officially, when he started, he wasn't anything, that is, anything in particular. Sort of general assistant, assistant section hand, assistant boiler washer, assistant anything you like to everybody, 
Marley's duties, if nothing else, were multifarious. Physically, he was a queer card. He was built on plans that gave you the impression Dame Nature had been doing a little something herself along the lines of original research and experimentation, and wasn't well enough satisfied with the result to duplicate it. Anyway, as far as anyone ever knew, there wasn't but one Marley produced. Maybe Nature, even, isn't infallible. Maybe she made a mistake, maybe she didn't. You couldn't call him deformed, and yet you could. That's Marley, exactly. When you get to describing him, you get contradictory. It must have been his neck. That lopped off two or three inches from his stature because he hadn't any. But if that shortened him down to, say, five feet five, which isn't so short, after all, there's the contradiction again, you see. The length of his arms, at least, was something to marvel at. They made up for the neck. Regan used to say Marley could stand on the floor of the roundhouse and clean out an engine pit without leaning over. The master mechanic was more or less gifted with imagination, but he wasn't so far out, not more than a couple of feet or so at that. Marley's hair, more than anything else that comes handy by way of comparison, was like the stuff in color and texture the fellows on the stage light and put in their mouths so as to blow out smoke like a belching stack under forced draft toe they call it eyes no woman ever had any like them big and round and wide with a peculiar violet tinge to them and lids that had a trick of closing down with a little hesitating flutter like a girl trying to flirt with you but what's the use marley piecemeal would never look like the short stepping springy walk foreshortened arms flopping marley with the greasy black peaked cap pulled over his forehead the greasy jumper tucked into greasier overalls, who sold his hybrid services to the transcontinental for the munificent sum of a dollar ten a day. Marley's arrival and introduction to Big Cloud was like Marley himself decidedly out of the ordinary and by no manner of means commonplace. Marley arrived bowing it in a refrigerator car. They iced the cars at Big Cloud, and luckily for Marley, the particular one he had in some unexplained way managed to appropriate, required a little something more than icing. They pulled him out in about as flabby a condition as a sack of flour. He didn't say anything for himself, mainly because he was pretty nearly past ever saying anything for himself or anybody else. The boys who found him cursed fluently because he wasn't a pleasant sight, and then carried him up Main Street on the door of a boxcar with the hazy notion that McGuire's Blazing Star Saloon was the most fitting mecca available. Marley continued to play in luck. Mrs. Coogan, the mother of Chick Coogan, that is, who went out in the fall blizzard on the Devil's Slide some years back, spotted the procession as it passed her little shack, halted it, made a hasty but nonetheless comprehensive examination, amplified it by a few scathing remarks on discovering the proposed destination, peremptorily ordered them into her bit of a cottage, and installed Marley therein. He was pretty far gone, pretty far, and he hung on the ragged edge for weeks. Nobody knows what Mrs. Coogan did for him except Marley himself, but it was generally conceded that she did more than she could afford for anybody, let alone doing it for a stray hobo. Marley got well in time, of course, for then old motherly Mrs. Coogan there was no better nurse, even if she had few comforts and dainties and less money to buy them with. And then Marley got a job, or rather Mrs. Coogan got one for him. There wasn't anything Mrs. Coogan could have asked for and not got that was within their power to give her. She was Chick's mother, and with Carleton or Regan or any of the rest of them that was enough. But Mrs. Coogan never asked anything for herself. She had the Coogan pride. The good Lord be praised. She would say. Mrs. Coogan was sincerely devout. I am able to work, and so I am. And why should I? Why should she? They smiled at her as men smile when something touches them under the vest and they want to say the proper thing, and can't. They smiled and gave her their washing. Mrs. Coogan tackled Regan on Marley's behalf. The master mechanic scratched his head in perplexity, but his reply was prompt and hearty enough. Sure, sure thing, Mrs. Coogan, he said. Send him down to me. I find him something to do. 
to Marley he talked a little differently. "'I ain't quite sure I like the looks of you,' he flung out bluntly enough, taking in the new man from head to toe. "'There's no job for you, but I'll give you a chance.' Marley's eyes came down in a flutter. "'Thanks, sir,' he mumbled nervously. Tommy Regan wasn't used to being sirred. The Hill Division did its business with few handles, and it wasn't long on the amenities. Huh! he ejaculated with a snort, and a stream of blackstrap laid the dust on a good few inches of engine cinders. You can hand any thanks you got coming over to Mother Coogan, and say— The master mechanic wriggled his fat forefinger under Marley's nose. Thanks are all right as far as they go, but I figure you owe her something over and above that, what? A faint flush came into Marley's cheeks, and he darted a quick look at Regan. His eyes were on the ground, and his hands had suddenly disappeared in his pockets before he answered. I I'm going to board with her a spell, he said in a slow way, as though he was measuring every word before it was uttered. Ah, huh? grunted Regan, but the grunt carried a grudging note of approval. Well, maybe that'll help some. You can report at noon, Marley, and make yourself generally handy around. I reckon you'll find enough to do. Thanks, sir, said Marley again as he turned away. Regan, leaning on the turntable push bar in front of the roundhouse, followed with his eyes as the other crossed the tracks in the direction of the town. Then he spat profoundly again. Queerest looking specimen that ever blew into the mountains. And we've had some before that were in a whole class by themselves at that, he remarked, screwing up his eyebrows. Makes you think of a blasted gorilla the way he's laid out, what? Well, we'll give him a try, anyway. And with a final glance in the direction of the retreating figure, the master mechanic went into the roundhouse for his morning inspection of the big moguls on the pits. It took the division and Big Cloud some time to size up the new man, and then just about when they thought they had, they found they hadn't. Marley, if he was nothing else, was a contradictory specimen. Mrs. Coogan said it was like the good Lord was kind of paying her special attention, kind of giving her another son. So quiet and accommodating and handy to have around. A good boy was Marley, a fine lad. One hand would rest on her hip and the other would smooth the thin white hair over her ear with quick, nervous little pats as she talked, and the grey Irish eyes, a little dim now, would light up happily. Yes, it's more than I deserve, but I always knew the Lord would provide. Tain't so easy to move the tubs around as it used to be. I guess I knew it, but I was, wasn't was willing to admit it till I had somebody to do it for me. Seventy-one I was last birthday. Tain't old for a man, but a woman. Ah, indeed, he's a fine lad, and tis myself that says it. Down at headquarters, Mrs. Coogan's praise went a long way and after Carlton and Regan and the others in the office got accustomed to seeing him around, they came to accept him in a passive, indifferent sort of a way. He was a curious case, if you like, but inoffensive. They let it go at that. The men had their viewpoint. Marley didn't talk much, didn't draw out the way a new hand was expected to in order to establish his footing with the fraternity. Least of all did he make any overtures tending to anything like an intimate relationship with any of his new associates. Marley was never one of the group behind the storekeeper's office that had stolen out from the shops for a drag at their pipes and a breath of air, never on the platform to exchange a word of banter with the crews of the incoming trains, never amongst the wipers and ostlers in the roundhouse who lounged in idle moments in the lee of a ten-wheeler with an eye out across the yards against the possible intrusion of Regan or some other embodiment of authority. He was civil enough and quick enough to answer when he was spoken to, but his words were few, no more than a simple negative or affirmative if he could help it. And when he himself was in question there was not even that. Marley became dumb. All this did not help him any. He wasn't what you'd uh, call exactly popular. So if he had little to say for himself, the men had plenty, and the general opinion was that he was a surly brute, that by no possible chance was any credit to the Hill Division, and by no manner of means an acquisition to Big Cloud. A few, very few, took a more charitable view, basing it on the shy, slow flutter of Marley's eyelids. 
they charged it up to an acute sensitiveness of his grotesque and abnormal appearance that isn't the way they put it though looks like hell and he knows it said they judicially let the beggar alone it was good advice whether their analysis was or wasn't pete boileau the baggage master can vouch for that as the time-worn saying has it it came like a bolt from the blue and but just a minute we're overrunning our targets and that means trouble things had gone along as far as marley was concerned without anything very startling or out of the way happening for quite a spell and Regan, who had stood closer to Chick Coogan than any other man on the division before the young engineer died, had begun to look on Marley with a little more interest, as a sort of deus ex machina for Mrs. Coogan. It seemed to afford the big-hearted master mechanic a good deal of relief. He got to talking about it to Carleton one morning, about a month after Marley's advent on the Hill Division. "'No, of course I don't know anything about him,' he said. "'Nobody does. I guess they don't. "'But he minds his own business and does what he has to do well enough, hm? "'The old lady's been getting a little feeble lately, kind of wearing out, I guess she is. "'I was thinking Marley was worth a little more than a dollar ten a day, what?' "'They were sitting in the super's office, "'and Carleton's glance, straying out through the window from where he sat at his desk, "'fastened on marley's clumsy ungainly figure hopping across the yard tracks from the roundhouse toward the station platform he smiled a little and looked back at regan i guess so tommy if it'll do her any good i wouldn't bank on it though he's a queer card impresses you with the feeling that there's something you ought to know about him and don't i've a notion somehow i've seen him before have you said regan that's funny I've thought I had myself once or twice, but I guess it's imagination more than anything else. Anyway, he seems to remember what Mrs. Coogan did for him. I don't know what she'd do even now without the board money, little as it is to help out. There's no use borrowing trouble, I suppose. But later on I don't know what on earth she'll do. She's prouder than a sceptered queen, and she won't be able to wash much longer, nor take a boarder either, what? Carleton sucked at his briar for a moment in silence. "'We've all got to face the possibility of the scrap heap some day, Tommy,' he said soberly. "'But it's harder for a woman, I'll admit, bitter hard. Sometimes things don't seem just right. If you want to give Marley a small raise, go ahead.' The master mechanic nodded his head. "'I think I will,' he announced. "'He's queer, if you like, but that's his own business.' Never a word out of him, nor a bit of trouble, since Regan's words stopped as though they had been chopped off with a knife. Both men, as though actuated by a single impulse, had leaped to their feet. Behind them their chairs toppled unheeded with a crash to the floor, and for an instant, as their eyes met each other's, the color faded in their cheeks. It had come and gone like a flash, a wild hoarse scream of rage, a brute scream, horrid blood curdling like the jungle howl of some maddened beast plunged in a savage, blind, all-possessing paroxysm of fury. Themselves again in a second, the master mechanic and the superintendent sprang to the window. On the platform, up at the far end, the great form of Pete Boileau rocked and swayed like a drunken man, and clinging to him, his legs twined around the other's knees, his arms locked around the baggage master's body just above the elbows, was Marley. Regan and Carlton gazed spellbound. There was something uncanny, inhuman about the scene, like a rabid dog that had leaped, snarling for the throat hold. Suddenly Marley's legs, with a quick wriggling slide, released their hold, his whole form appeared to shrink, grow smaller, he seemed to crouch on his knees at the other's feet, then his body jerked itself erect to its full stature with a movement swift as a loose bowstring. His arms flew up, carrying a great burden, and over his shoulders, over his head, a sprawling form hurtled through the air. "'Merciful God, he's killed him!' gasped Carlton, dashing for the door. "'Come on, Tommy, quick!' Both men were down the stairs in a space of time that Regan, at least chunky and fat, had never duplicated before or since. Carlton, hard-faced and tight-lipped, led the way, with the picture beating into his brain of Boileau's senseless form on the ground and the other above tearing like a beast at its prey.' 
He wrenched the door of the station open, sprang out onto the platform, stopped involuntarily, and then ran forward again. The baggage master's form was on the ground, lying in a curled-up, huddled heap, and he was senseless all right, if he wasn't something more than that. But the rest of Carleton's mental picture was wrong, dead wrong. Right beside where the fight, if fight it could be called, had taken place was a baggage truck, and over this, his head down, his two great arms wound round his face, shoulders heaving in convulsive sobs, Marley was crying like a broken-hearted child. Take him any way you like, look at him any way you like, Marley, whatever else he was, was a contradictory specimen. Any other man with a skull a shade less tender than Boileau's, it must have been made of boilerplate, would never have drawn another paycheck, and even granting the boilerplate part of it, it was something to wonder at. He had gone through the air like a rocket, and his head had caught the full of it when he landed. How far? Carlton never said. He measured it, twice, but he never gave out the figures of Boileau's aerial flight. Pete was a big man, six feet something, and heavy for his height. The strength of four ordinary men concentrated in one pair of arms might have done it, perhaps. Mathematically, it wouldn't figure out any other way. Carleton never said, But what's the use? The division did some tall thinking over it, and Marley cried. They picked up Pete Boileau and carried him into the station, and the contents of a fire bucket over his head opened his eyes. But it was a good fifteen minutes before he could talk, and by that time, when they got over their scare and thought of Marley, the baggage truck was deserted. "'What started it?' growled Boileau, repeating Carlton's inquiry. "'I'm hanged if I know. I was jossing him a little. Nothing to make anybody sore. I was only funning anyhow and laughing when I said it.' "'Said what?' demanded Regan, cutting in. "'Why, nothing much. He looked so queer hopping across the tracks like a monkey on a stick that I just asked him why he didn't cut out railroading and hit up a museum for a job.' And then before I knew it, he let out a screech and was on me like a blasted catamount. Serves you right, said the master mechanic gruffly. I guess you won't nag him again. I guess you won't. And none of the other men won't neither if they've had any notion that way. He's a wicked little devil, snarled Boileau. And the strength of him. The baggage master shivered. He ain't human. He'll kill somebody yet. That's what he'll do. Pete's summing up was a popular one. The men promptly ticketed and carded Marley as one per Boileau's bill of lading. There wasn't any more doubt about him, no discussions, no anything. They knew Marley at last, and they liked him less than ever. But also they imbibed a very wholesome respect for the welfare of their own skins. A man with arms whose strength is the strength of Derrick Booms is to be approached with some degree of caution. Marley himself said nothing. Carlton and Regan got him on the carpet and tried to get his version of the story, but for all they got out of him they might as well have saved their time. A pathetic enough-looking figure, in a way, he was, as he stood in the super's office the afternoon of the fight. The shoulders were drooping, giving the arms an even longer appearance than usual, no color in his face, the violet eyes almost black, with a dead, hunted look in them, Sorrow, remorse, dread, neither Regan nor Carlton knew. They couldn't understand him then. Marley offered no explanation, volunteered nothing. Boileau's story was right, that was all. You might have killed the man, said Carlton sternly, at the end of an unsatisfactory twenty minutes. You can thank your maker you haven't his blood on your hands. It's a miracle you haven't. Don't you know your own strength? We can't have that sort of thing around here. Marley's face seemed to grow even whiter than before, and he shivered a little, though the afternoon was dripping wet with the heat and the thermometer was sizzling well up in the nineties. He shivered, but his lips were hard shut, and he didn't say a word. Carlton, for once in his life when it came to handling men, didn't seem to be altogether sure of himself. An ordinary fight was one thing, and generally speaking, strictly the men's own business. But everything about Marley, from his arrival at Big Cloud to the sudden beast-like ferocity he had displayed that morning, put a little different complexion on the matter. A puzzled look settled on the super's face as he glanced from Marley to the master mechanic while his fingers drummed a tattoo on the edge of his desk. 
"'You had some provocation, Marley,' he said slowly. "'I don't want you to think I'm not taking that into consideration, "'but not enough to work up any such deviltry as you exhibited. "'You'll never get on with the men after this. "'They'll make things pretty hard for you. "'I think you'd better go, for your own sake.' There was dead silence in the super's room for a half minute. Then Regan, who had been sitting with his chair tilted back and his feet up on the window sill, dropped the chair legs to the floor and swung around. "'I put Logan up firing yesterday,' said he. "'There's a night job wiping in the roundhouse. What do you say about it, Carlton?' It was Marley who answered. "'Yes!' he said fiercely. Carlton jabbed at the bowl of his pipe with his forefinger and his eyebrows went up at Marley's sudden animation. Marley's eyes met his with a single quick glance, and then the eyelids fluttered down, covering them. There was something in the look that caught the super, something he couldn't define. There was a plea, but there was something more, like a pledge, almost, it seemed. "'All right,' he said shortly, then nodding at Marley in dismissal. "'I hope you will remember what I've said. You may go.' Marley hesitated as though about to speak, and changed his mind, evidently, for he turned, walked straight to the door, and out, then his boots creaked down the stairs. "'He'll be away from the men there, all except a few,' said the master mechanic, as though picking up the thread of a discussion. "'And as for them, I'll see there's no trouble. There's Mrs. Coogan now that—' "'Yes, Tommy,' Carlton smiled a little. "'I didn't put your interest all down to love for Marley.' "'What gets me?' muttered Regan, screwing up his eyes, as his teeth met in the plug he had dragged with some labor from his hip pocket. What gets me is the way he went to crying afterward, like a kid he was. It was the blamedest thing I ever saw, what? I don't think he's responsible for himself when he gets like that, replied Carleton. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. It comes over him in a flash, making a very demon of him, and then the relaxation the other way is just as uncomfortable. I don't suppose he can help it. He's made that way. It wouldn't make so much difference in an ordinary man, but with strength like his— Carlton blew a ring of smoke ceilingward. You saw what he did to Boileau. I ain't likely to forget it, said Regan. But if he's left alone, I guess he'll be all right. Any man that's fool enough to do anything else now will do it with his eyes open, and it's his own funeral. Those of the night crew in the roundhouse were evidently of the same mind. They received him, it is true, with little evidence of cordiality, but their aloofness was decidedly pronounced, and they looked askance at the queer figure as it dodged in and out of the shadows cast by the big mountain racers, or at times stood silently by one of the engine doors under the dim light of an oil lamp staring out across the black of the turntable to the twinkling switch lights in the yard. They didn't like him, but they had learned their lesson well, and as the weeks slipped away they practiced it. He was to be left alone. One thing they grudgingly admitted. Marley could work, and did. Clara, who, the night-turner, was man enough to give another his due any time, no matter what his own personal feelings might be, and there was some talk after a bit between him and the master mechanic about Marley getting the next spare run firing. Clarahu even went so far as to hint at it as a possibility to Marley, and for his pains got a surprise. He wasn't used to seeing the chance of promotion turned down. Marley had shaken his head and would have none of it. He was satisfied where he was. That was all there was to that. Clarahu drew back into his shell after that. Marley could wipe till his hair was gray for all he cared. So Marley wiped. But at Mrs. Coogan's cottage, as the summer waned, there wasn't as much washing done as there had been, and the company doctor got to dropping in too frequently to put his visits down to the old-time occasional friendly calls for an afternoon chat. And then, one day in the early fall, the washing stopped altogether, and the doctor's face was puckered and serious as he left the cottage and headed down Main Street to the station. He entered Carleton's office, and after a few words between them, the super sent for Regan. That evening, Carlton's private car was waiting on the siding when Number 2, the eastbound limited, Chick Coogan's old train, pulled in. 
as the little yard switcher importantly coughed the super's car on to the rear pullman regan in his sunday best a store suit of black twill with boiled shirt and stiff collar came out of the station with mrs coogan on his arm an incongruous pair they looked the little old lady's walk was in painful contrast to the burly master mechanic's stride her short steps had a painful, hesitating, uncertain waver to them. One hand gripped tenaciously at Regan's coat sleeve, while the other held the faded, old-fashioned shawl close about her thin, bent shoulders. She carried her head, drooped forward a little, hiding the face under the quaint poke bonnet. A moment later Carlton, too, emerged from the station and joined them. The station hands and the loungers eyed the trio with curiosity, and then stared in amazement as the two officials helped the old lady up the stairs of the private car. Mrs. Coogan was getting the best of it. Whatever it meant. The three disappeared inside, but presently Regan and Carlton came out again, and the super dropped to the station platform. He held out his hand to the master mechanic as Frank Knowles, the conductor, lifted his finger to Burke in the cab. "'Good-bye, Tommy, and good luck,' he called as the train began to move out. Don't hurry. Take all the time you need. All right, Regan shouted back. Goodbye. Carlton stood for a moment, watching the tail lights grow dimmer until finally they shot suddenly out of sight around the curve of the track. Then he turned to walk back along the platform and stopped. Crouched back against the wall of the freight house, deep in the shadows, was Marley. Here, you, Marley, Carlton called. Marley, evidently believing himself to have been unobserved, started violently and then came slowly forward what are you hiding there for demanded the super i wanted to see mrs coogan off marley announced a little defiantly the tone of the other's voice did not please carleton you've a queer way of doing it then he snapped shortly marley was twisting his hands staring down the track i i said good-bye before i came down to work he spoke as though talking to himself Oh, said Carlton, and looked at Marley sharply. I suppose you know what she went east for? Yes, said Marley gruffly. That was all, just yes. And with that he turned abruptly and started across the tracks for the roundhouse. Carlton, taken aback, watched him in angry amazement. Then the scowl that had settled on his face broke in a smile, and he shrugged his shoulders. Guess Tommy is right, he muttered as he went on toward the office. Marley is all in a class by himself. We've never had anything like him in the mountains before. It was four days before Mrs. Coogan and the master mechanic came back, days during which Marley slipped into Dutchy's lunch counter at deserted moments for his meals, and, if that were possible, drew into himself closer than ever. The boys were curious about Mrs. Coogan, naturally, curious enough even to question Marley. He had one answer, only one. She's sick, I guess, he said. They got nothing more out of him than that. One thing Marley did, though, that Clara, who, while he thought nothing of it at the time, remembered well enough afterwards, he'd asked the turner to give him a sheet of railroad paper and a manila, and in his spare moments, the night before Mrs. Coogan came back, he labored, bent over the little desk where the engine crews signed on and off, scratching painstakingly with a pen. Clara, who caught a glimpse of the sheet in passing before Marley hastily covered it up. Just a glimpse, not enough to read a single word, just enough to marvel a little at the wiper's hand. Marley was a pretty good penman. Marley, of course, being on night duty, slept daytimes, but the afternoon Regan brought Mrs. Coogan back to the cottage, he must have heard them coming, for he was standing in the little sitting-room when they came in. Mrs. Coogan kind of hesitated on the threshold, then she called out quickly in a faltering way. Marley, Marley, is that you? Marley was twisting his hands nervously. His eyes shot a rapid glance from the old lady to the master mechanic, and then the eyelids fluttered down. Sure, he said. It's me. She stumbled toward him and burst into tears, crying as though her heart would break. Oh, Marley, Marley. She sobbed. Don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. There's a good boy, Marley. Marley never moved. Just licked his lips with his tongue, and his face grew whiter. Queer the way he acted, well, perhaps. Never a move to catch the frail, tottering figure, never a word to soothe the pitiful grief 
He stood like a man listening to a judge pronounces his doom. Oh, yes, queer, if you like. Marley, whatever else he was, was a contradictory specimen. It was Regan who caught the old lady in his arms and led her gently into her bedroom off the parlor. You mustn't give way like that, Mrs. Coogan, he said kindly. Just lay down for a spell and you'll feel better. I'll ask Mrs. Dalene next door to come in. It took the master mechanic several minutes to quiet her and persuade her to do as he asked, but when he came out again Marley was still standing, exactly as before, in the center of the room. With a black scowl on his face, Regan motioned the other outside, and once on the street he laid the wiper low. Hard-tongued was Regan when his temper was aroused, and he did not choose his words. "'What do you mean by treating her like that, you scrapings from the junk heap, you?' he exploded. You know well enough what she went away for, and if you've any brains in that ugly head of yours, you know well enough what she's come back to, without any printed instructions to help you out. What are you playing at, eh? What do you mean? You're not fit to associate with a dog. And she the woman that spent about her all to save your miserable carcass, you, you... You'd better stop. The words came like the warning hiss of a serpent before it strikes. Marley's face was livid, and his great gnarled hands were creeping slowly upward above his waistline. With a startled oath, Regan leaped quickly back, and then, separated by a yard, the men stood eyeing each other in silence. It was gone in a flash as it had come, for Marley, with a shudder, dropped his hands limply to his sides, and the color crept slowly back into his cheeks. "'There is no chance for her.' No trace of the passionate outburst of an instant before remained, the question came, low, hesitating, more like an assertion combined with a wistful appeal for contradiction. It took Regan longer to recover himself, and it was a minute before he answered. Then he shook his head. "'She'll be stone-blind in a month,' he said gruffly. Marley's eyes came up to the master mechanics and drooped instantly with their habitual little fluttering. Hey, "'Ain't no doubt no chance of a mistake,' he ventured. Again Regan shook his head. Not a chance. The best man we could find east made the examination. We're arranging to get her into an institute, a home for the blind somewhere. I thought you would. Marley's voice was monotonous. That's what she was talking about, wasn't it? Yes, said Regan. Marley wagged his head with a judicial air. That'll kill her, he remarked, as though stating a self-evident but commonplace fact. That'll kill her. I'm afraid it will the master mechanic admitted gravely. But there's nothing else to do. It's impossible for her to stay here. She's got to have someone to look after her, and she has no money. God knows I wish we could, but we can't see any other way than put her in some place like that. I, I, I thought you would if it turned out bad, said Marley again in dead tones. I figured it out that way when you were gone. His hands were traveling in an aimless fashion in and out of his pockets. Suddenly he half pulled out an envelope, started, hastily shoved it back, and looked at Regan. I, uh, I, I got a letter to post, he muttered. Well, supposing you have, said Regan a little savagely. Regan wasn't interested in letters just then. Supposing you have. You needn't. But Marley was well across the street. The master mechanic gasped angrily, choked, and went into Mrs. Dalheen's cottage on his errand. It was wasted breath to talk to Marley anyhow. It didn't take long for the news to spread around Big Cloud, and for three days they talked about Mrs. Coogan pretty constantly. After that they talked about Marley. The westbound limited schedules Big Cloud for 2.05 in the afternoon, and on the third day after Mrs. Coogan's return, Marley came down the street about half-past one and crossed the tracks to the shops. Regan was in the fitting shop when Marley walked in. "'I'd like to speak to you,' said Marley, going straight up to the master mechanic. "'Well,' grunted Regan, none too cordially, I "'I'd like you to come over to Mr. Carlton's office with me.' There was something in Marley's voice, feverish, impelling, something in his face that stopped the impatient question that sprang to Regan's lips. He looked at the ungainly, grotesque figure of the wiper for an instant curiously, then, without a word, led the way out of the shops. They traversed the yard in silence, climbed the stairs in the station, and entered the super's room. Marley closed the door and stood with his back against it. Carleton, at his desk, looked from one to the other in surprise. 
Hello, said he, what's up? The master mechanic jerked his thumb at Marley and appropriated a chair. He wanted me to come over. I don't know what for. Carleton turned inquiringly to the wiper. What is this? he demanded. Marley walked slowly across the room until he reached the super's desk. His face was drawn, and he wet his lips with the tip of his tongue. "'It's about Mrs. Coogan,' he said jerkily. Five thousand would be enough, wouldn't it?' Carleton stared at the man as though he were mad, and Regan hitched his chair suddenly forward. "'Will you swear to give it to her if I get it for you?' Marley's hand, clenched, was on the desk, and he leaned his body far forward toward the super. There was no flutter of the eyelids now, and his eyes stared into Carleton's without a flicker. "'Swear it!' he cried fiercely. Carleton drew back involuntarily. "'Marley,' he said soothingly, "'you're not yourself. You—' "'No, I'm not mad,' Marley broke in passionately. "'I know what I'm talking about. I know she'd die in one of them charity places. It's up to me. She treated me white, the only soul on God's earth that ever did. And maybe— Maybe too it'll help square accounts. You'll play fair and swear she gets the money, won't you? I don't understand, said Carleton slowly, but I'll swear to give her anything you have to give. Marley nodded quickly. That, that's all I want, he said. There ain't much to understand. He fumbled in his pocket and brought out a newspaper clipping, a column long, which he laid on the desk. I guess you'll get it all there. The heavy set of the heading leaped up at Carleton. Five thousand dollars reward. Below, halfway down the column, was the reproduction of a photograph. Marley's. Regan was up from his chair, bending over the super's shoulder. I thought I'd seen you somewhere before. Carleton's voice sounded strained and hollow in his own ears. It must have been the picture. I remember now. You, uh, you killed a man in Denver a year ago. Yeah, it's all there, said Marley, licking his lips again. I never saw him before. I killed him like I almost killed Boileau this summer. I didn't know till afterward that he was rich, not until the family hung out that reward. Carleton did not speak. Regan reached viciously for his plug. Marley stirred uneasily and drew the back of his hand across his forehead. It came away soggy wet. In the silence the chime of the Limited's whistle floated in through the open window, then presently the roar of the train and the grinding shriek of the brake shoes. "'My God!' said Carlton in a whisper. "'You want me to give you up and get the reward for her?' A queer smile flickered across Marley's face. Heavy steps come running up the stairs. There was a smart rap upon the door, and a man stepped quickly inside. For a second his eyes swept the little group. Then he whirled like a flash, and the blue-black muzzle of a revolver held a bead on Marley's heart. "'Ah, Shorty,' he cried grimly. "'Yeah, we've got you at last, huh? Put out your hands.' Without protest, with the same queer smile on his face, Marley obeyed. There was a little click of steel, and he dropped his locked wrists before him. "'You're Mr. Carlton, ain't you?' the newcomer was swung to the desk. "'Yes,' said Carlton numbly. "'I'm Hepburn of the Denver Police,' went on the officer. "'We appreciate this, Mr. Carleton. "'Shorty here has been badly wanted for a long time. "'We got your letter yesterday.' "'Hepburn paused to reach into his pocket, "'and in the pause Carleton's eyes met Marley's, and he understood. "'Marley had written the letter himself and signed his Carleton's name, "'and to it was clear enough now the telegram he had puzzled over the previous afternoon.' It was lying before him on his desk. His eyes dropped to it. We'll be on hand on arrival of Limited, signed Denver. Oh, we can't give you any receipt for him as you requested, continued Hepburn, drawing a paper out of his pocket. But here's an acknowledgment that his capture is due to information furnished by you. I guess that will answer the purpose. You won't have any trouble getting the reward. He handed the paper to Carleton. The super took it mechanically and started as it crackled in his fingers. Now, said Hepburn briskly, I don't want to appear abrupt, but there's a local east of 220. We'll move along, Shorty. Goodbye, Mr. Carlton. Next time you're in Denver, look us up. He took Marley's arm and moved toward the door. Don't uh, tell her, Mr. Carlton, 
There was a catch in Marley's voice, and the words came low. Carleton did not answer. He was staring at the paper in his hand. Marley's price. Regan had turned his back with a hasty movement of his fist to his eyes. Don't tell her. The plea came again from the doorway. Carleton tried to speak, and his voice broke. Then he cleared his throat. She will never know, Marley, he said huskily. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Ten The Man Who Didn't Count. He was a little gray haired hostler, wiper, sweeper, assistant night man in the roundhouse at Big Cloud, anything you like. And this is the story he told me one night, leaning against the blackened jam of one of the big doors wiping his hands occasionally upon a hunk of greasy waste. They were a rough lot out in the mountains in the days when the Hill Division was shaking her steel into something like a permanent right-of-way. A pretty rough lot. The railroaders, just because they had to be. The rest, because they were just that way, naturally. Miners and Indians made up the citizenship mostly, and there's no worse mixture. They've got the redskins corralled on reserves now, but, but they hadn't been, and it didn't take more than one bad word and one drop of bad whiskey to set things in lively motion. There's a few highfalutin' poems and some other things about the noble red man that works you up so when you read them that you get to wishing the Almighty had seen fit to let you be a red man, too. Well, that's all right in its way, because... After you've rubbed elbows with some of the real thing, you realize that the world owes the poets a living just as much as it does anybody else, and that what they say has to sound good, so you just come in to keep the cautionary signals up by instinct and let it go at that. But to, to give the poets their due, there's one thing they never trip up on, and that's the Indian's compound efficiency for smell. The Indian can smell. When he sticks out his chest, faces southeast, and begins to draw in the God-given mountain air, you're free to bet that the distilleries down in Kentucky way are doing enough business to make regular dividend checks a sure thing. That's generally good whiskey. Bad whiskey, in smell and otherwise, carries farther, and it's only fifteen miles from here to Coyote Bend. Coyote Bend wasn't even a pinprick on the engineers' blueprints when they mapped out the right-of-way, and there wasn't any such place when the steel was all spiked down until the day some wandering prospector staked out a bunch of claims and the news spread. <laughs> Gold in the Rockies? No, uh, there's never been much of it found, but there's an all-fired big superstition that the mother load of the whole country is tucked away there somewhere. That's why in two days the wilderness and the gurgling stream that trickled peacefully down through a high-walled canyon became Coyote Bend, and that's why the local freight began to make regular stops to dump off supplies alongside the track. There was no station, of course, no agent, no nothing. The stuff was just dumped, that's all. The consignees picked out their goods if they could read, or guessed at it if they couldn't. Maybe I ought to have told you before this. Anyway, I'll stick it in now. There are three men that figure in this story, though one of them doesn't count for much. He was a young chap named Charlie Lee, a graduate of an eastern college he was, and all he had to his name was his diploma and the clothes he stood in when he hit the West. He struck the super for a job, and he got it, raking on the local freight. Hell for a man like him, huh? <laughs> Well, it was, in more ways than one. Anyway, from that day to this, it was the best job he ever held down long enough to draw a second month's paycheck. The other two were Matt Purley and Pharaoh Clancy. Breed Clancy, they called him, behind his back. Purley was a very good sort, pretty straight, pretty clean, measuring by the standards out there in those days. A little bit of a sawed-off, blonde-haired, blue-eyed man, full of grit inside, and an out-and-out -out railroad man. 
only a freight conductor conductor on the local but he knew his business he'd have gone up way up in time clancy was a hellion and no other name for him and even that doesn't express it no one word could indian one way irish the other he looked mostly indian the irish came out in the brogue black swarthy small eyes like needle points coarse dry hair that straggled down over his eyebrows a hulking bony frame with the strength of a wrecking crane <laughs> well, that's clancy breed clancy oh yes he was slick slick as they're made with his hands faro stud poker dice anything it was his business that and running booze joints mining camps and brand new boom towns where clancy's meet mostly after pearly drove him out of big cloud <laughs> don't ask me i don't know what there was between them that was before my time a woman probably a woman's generally blamed anyhow anyway one night pearly got the drop on breed and marched him down the street in front of his pistol and out of town after that clancy kept away from big cloud as i say that part was before my time i only know there was bad blood between them wicked bad blood on one side as you'll see clancy disappeared from big cloud and the two didn't foul each other again until coyote bend started breed clancy hit the bend with the first inrush of the miners and before any of them had time to much more than get a pick into the ground he was busy knocking together a bit of a shack he called a hotel and was ordering the furnishings liquid furnishings you understand from big cloud there were three barrels of it the hardest kind of fire water that ever went into the mountains way billed to clancy at coyote bend by the local on the first trip that charlie lee ever made with matt Purley. Uh, i'm getting back to lee now you see well it was about noon when they whistled for the bend that day and lee riding the brake wheels on the front end could see about a dozen blankets squatting alongside the right of way about where the train would stop grouped behind these was a number of stragglers from the camp among whom was a big fella in a red shirt you couldn't see farther than a semaphore arm now i don't say those indians were attracted by the gold rush in coyote bend coyote bend or any other place old or new stale or prosperous would get its share of the redskins where they came from or where they went nobody knew they'd drop in from nowhere and if they liked the place they'd grunt and settle down for a spell if they didn't like it they'd grunt in benediction or otherwise and leave i'm not saying they smelled the whiskey in that train i'm not saying they knew clancy was important fire water and they were just there to feast their eyes on the barrels and meditate on what was inside i'm not saying anything at all about that or what followed there's only one man that perhaps might have explained it i say perhaps because he never did and also because he knew indian nature as well as any white man in the west that was pearly whether pearly even knew that clancy was at the bend or not i don't know i only know that he could have uh, known it if he'd bothered to read the waybills and it was likewise on the cards that he might have learned the day before down at big cloud that the whiskey was going up the following morning i don't know and that's straight sometimes i think he did sometimes i think he didn't i don't know anyway lee slid to the ground as the train stopped and went back to the car that held the consignment for the bend as he fumbled with the door he got a whiff of raw spirit that nearly knocked him over and then right behind him rose a chorus of appreciative oogs i told you an indian could smell whiskey but i didn't tell you why it's his ruling passion that's straight i'm not judging the indian the taste was born in him there are some white men just as bad i'm not judging them either some drink for the same reason the indian does some for others and some some men drink because they have to what was i saying oh yeah lee getting that whiff well before he got the door unfastened the man in the red shirt had pushed through the indians and come up beside him my name's clancy said he did you bring any stuff for me there's three barrels for somebody replied lee and slid open the door and the next minute he had jumped back with a yell colliding with clancy 
Oh, ejaculated the apparition that confronted him. He's drunk, majestically drunk, and on my stuff, roared Clancy, and then turning fiercely on Lee, What did you let him in there for? What did you let him in for, you mealy-faced little... Let him in nothing, retorted Lee, getting back his grip on himself. Here, you, get out, and quick. The Indian blinked gravely, but never moved. He sat cross-legged on the floor, exactly in the middle of the car, between the doors, swaying slightly backward and forward. Beside him, upended and broached, was one of Clancy's kegs. The car reeked with the smell of it. For of the half keg fill that had gushed out, what hadn't gone into the Indian had gone on to the floor. The half-breed was raving mad. I have a notion sometimes a man wasn't human at all. He had his hand in Lee's throat when Pearlie came running up from the rear end. What's the row? he began, and then he stopped. He was a cool devil, was Pearlie, and he never turned a hair as he stepped between the two men. Ah, uh, Clancy, it's you, is it, you copper-faced renegade? No loud talk, no bluster, he didn't raise his voice. But his insult, the worst he could have laid his tongue to, cut like the sting of a lash. Clancy swung around like a flash and stared into the muzzle of the conductor's forty-five. His hands were clenching and unclenching as he recognized Burley, and the cords in his neck swelled with knotty lumps. It's your work, this job, is it? he snarled. Some day, Pearly, I'll show you. Queer, you say he'd act like that, nothing to warrant it. Well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what was between them before. But I do know the awful deviltry of Breed Clancy, and I know that Lee, leaning back against the door, shivered at the look that passed between the two of them. Pearly cut the half-breed short off. Once, said he contemptuously, still quiet, not a tone raised, and his voice more fully deadly for it. Once, perhaps you'll remember, I warned you to keep out of my road. Lee, how'd that Indian get in the car? I don't know, said Lee. Well, then, throw him out, said Pearlie shortly, snapping his watch with his free hand. We can't stay here all day. This little ruction between Pearlie and the half-breed has taken me longer to tell it, I guess, than it did to happen. Anyway, it didn't cause the excitement you might think it would. The blankets were too busy drinking in the smell of that whiskey to let their hungry eyes wander very far from anywhere but the open door of that car. And as for the stragglers, by the time they'd caught on to the fact that there was something on the boards beside the drunken Indian, Pearlie, with the same cool contempt, had slipped his gun back in his pocket and was boosting Lee into the car. The Indian offered no opposition as Lee tackled him. He couldn't. He was beyond all that. He was so full of dead eye it was oozing out of his pores. He just sat there, and Lee slid him to the door just as he was, still sitting, and dropped him out. He struck the ground with a thud, rebounded a foot, rolled over, grunted, and lay like a log. There was a guffaw from the camp stragglers and a deep and envious chorus of uggs from the blankets. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> It's a long way from a joke, as you'll see. They were envious. It acted like a red rag on a bull, the possibility of attaining the condition, the state of heavenly bliss, that had been reached by their red brother. Do you understand? <laughs> Clancy wasn't laughing. He stood where Pearlie had left him, sullen and with twitching face. I don't know, I think it was Pearlie's sheer nerve that kept the half-breed from drawing and shooting the conductor when his back was turned. I don't know. Brute beast cowed by the human mind, perhaps. No one ever knew Breed Clancy. He had his yellow streak at times, and then again the blood that was in him made him worse than a frenzied madman. Yes, I guess it was a case of brute, all right, for there was no cowing him when the frenzy was on him. Pearlie wasn't laughing either. He was opening and shutting his watch impatiently. Come on, come on, he cried at Lee. Get those barrels out. We got across number two at the creek. It'll be the carpet for ours if we hold her up. Lee grabbed the brooched cask and edged it toward the doorway. The contents slopped and sloshed inside as he moved it, and occasionally a little of the stuff would spill out through the bunghole. Then somehow, just as he got it to the door, his hold slipped, out it went, bounded on the edge of the ties, and then went down the embankment right into the hands of those squatting blankets. They didn't squat long. I don't need to tell you that. 
they were on it in a mob and they got the taste they'd had the smell and the fill was to come presently clancy was cursing in streams and no fouler mouthed man than clancy ever lived he tried once to get the indians off the barrel and the stragglers backed him up half-heartedly you might as well have tried to move that mogul on the pit there behind you he didn't try but once then he fell back on cursing again, and Pearlie was the target for most of it. Pearlie? <laughs> he never answered him, but his face grew harder and harder, and his gun was in his hand again. Throw out those other two barrels, he snapped at Lee. The Redskins will get every last drop if I do, objected Lee, hesitating. Owner's risk. There's no station here. Throw them out, repeated Pearlie, grimmer than before, only this time loud enough for Clancy to hear him. You do, roared the half-breed. You do, and I'll worse than murder you one of these. Throw em out, said Pearlie quietly, waving the go-ahead signal to the engine crew. And out they went, down the embankment after the first. Lee jumped to the ground and banged the door shut just as the drawbars began to snap tight along the train and the local jolted into motion. He waited beside Pearlie to swing the caboose as it came up, and while he waited he watched and grinned funny i don't know it depends on the way you look at it depends on uh, what you call fun lee thought it was funny then the air was full of curses indian yells shouts oaths and there was one jumbled mess of arms and legs and barrels the indians were after their fill and this time clancy and the stragglers were in the game for keeps up ahead the engine crew hung grinning out of the gangway Behind, the other brakeman was occupying a reserved seat on the top of the caboose. A quarter of a mile away from the camp, men, attracted by the shouting, were beginning to run toward the track. Inconsistent kind of a mix-up, huh? Indians, miners, whiskey barrels, and railroaders. I don't know. Call it funny if you like. Though perhaps you can size it up better when I'm through. By this time, the caboose was up to where Pearlie and Lee were standing. Pearly motioned Lee aboard and then swung on himself. Just as he did so, Clancy's red shirt loomed up out of the melee, his arm lifted, and over the clack of the car tracks pounding the steel came the tinkle of breaking glass from the shattering pane in the door. The bullet had passed between the heads of the two men on the platform, missing them by a hair's breadth. Another shot followed the first, another, and another, dangerously close, splintering the woodwork around them and then Pearlie fired. The half-breed spun round like a top, clamped his hand to his face, and pitched over. Then the curve of the track shut out the scene, but for five minutes after they were out of sight they still got the whoops of the redskins, the shouts and curses of the miner, and the crackle of guns like the quick fire of a gatling. You see, it came to that before it was through, and there was some blood spilled. A lot of it. And not counting Clancy's. It wasn't all blanket blood, either. Clancy? Well, I'm coming to him. No, he, he wasn't killed. If he had been, I'd never be telling you this story. It was two or three days before Lee and Pearlie got the details of what happened. The Redskins fought like fiends after the miners began to fire on them, and had killed one or two, and though they were finally subdued, the casualties, as I've said, weren't all on their side by a hang sight. Uh, but I was, I was talking about Clancy. Well, that bullet of Pearlie's caught him in the cheekbone, glanced in, plowed through his left eye, and landed up somewhere against the cartilage of his nose. A bullet'll make queer tracks sometimes, worse than surveyors, by a heap. They got him down to Big Cloud to a doctor's, and before he was half cured he disappeared. They had a sort of makeshift hospital here in those days. And when I say disappeared, I mean they found his bed empty one morning, that was all. I told you I didn't know whether Pearlie had any hand in putting the Indian in the car or the other red skids at the bend. I don't. I told you I didn't know what was between him and the half-breed before all this happened. I don't. Pearlie never said. But day after day, as he and Lee pounded up and down on the local through the mountains, he began to grow silent and moody. Lee, young Lee then, was the only one that could get anywhere near the inside of his vest. He took to Lee, and Lee liked him. But even Lee had his limits when it came to confidences. There was lots Pearlie never opened his lips about. 
No, I don't know as it makes much difference now. Lee was the first of the two to hear that Pharaoh Clancy was loose. It looks to me like a bad business, he said after telling Pearlie the news. Pearlie's eyes just narrowed a little. It looks more like a bad shot, a rotten bad shot, he answered evenly. That, if you like, returned Lee, but there'll be more to follow. One would think you knew Clancy, said Pearlie, cool as ever. Lee was anxious. Call it presentiment or what you like. From that moment the thing was on his nerves. Pearlie had been pretty good to him, had made things a heap easier for the young fellow, green and raw as he was, in a hundred different ways. Things like that mean something. Look here, Pearlie, said he. I've heard some talk, and I know there's something behind all this between you and that devil. I'm not asking for confidences. Pearlie cut him short and caught him almost angrily by the shoulder. Don't meddle, he snapped. Let it drop. You don't count in this, whatever happens. Your being at the bend that day was an accident. What's between me and Clancy concerns ourselves. You don't count. Unless you're looking for another run besides the local, just remember that, and don't meddle. That was all. Lee never mentioned it to Pearlie again. Pearlie was right, wasn't he? I told you there were three men in this story, but that one of them didn't count. No, Lee didn't count. Why should he? What did he have to do with it? Pearlie was right. I leave it to you. You've been over the division, and you know the devil's slide just west of the gap from here. You know the grade, the worst in the mountains. The trains crawl up at a pace a man could walk because they can't go any faster, and they crawl down just as slowly because they don't dare do anything else. I've seen passengers get off the observation and walk. So have you. Done it yourself, probably. I thought so. Extra engine on the rear end to push or hold back, and one in the middle if the train's heavy to keep it from breaking apart, lessens the drawbar pull, you know. They're tunneling now to do away with that particular grade, but that's nothing to do with this story, nor for that matter with the night some six weeks after that business at the bend, when the local eastbound was climbing Devil's Slide. It was a dirty night outside the caboose. A storm had been racketing through the mountains all afternoon, and by the time it got dark it was a howling gale, raining hard enough to float the ties. Lee's place was on the front end, going up that bit of track, but he wasn't well that night, and the other brakeman was doing his snatch. Touch a mountain fever or something, nothing serious. Just enough to make him shiver and boil alternately over the little stove in the caboose, sitting with his back to the door. Up above him in the cupola, holding down the swivel chair where he could watch the train, that is, see his engine fling up the sparks, for that's about all he could see, I guess, was Pearlie. The car was swinging like a hammock with the heave and strain of the big pusher coupled right behind it. It acts queer, that does. Every time I've felt it, I've always thought of a cat and a mouse. It's like the engine had the caboose by the scruff and was trying to shake the life out of it. You've felt it a little if you've ever been in the rear Pullman going up. The difference is that a caboose hasn't any springs to speak of, you understand? Racket enough to raise the dead. You couldn't hear yourself think. Not so much from the noise of the train or the storm, but from the booming roar of that trailer's exhaust, like she was trying to cough her boiler tubes out every time the valves slid. Now, there's just one more thing I want you to get. The engine crew of a pusher naturally can't see any track, roadbed, or anything of that kind, and it isn't their business to, either. All they watch is the leader and the intermediate, if there is one. Their headlight plays along over a few cars, if it's high enough, or loses itself on the top of the door or the roof of the caboose, if it isn't. Understand? Lee didn't hear anything. He was sitting bent over with his head between his hands. And it was the current of air from the opening door that made him twist around and look up, thinking it had blown open. I don't know if you'd call him a coward. Maybe yes, maybe no. Anyway, he was a white-faced, terrified man that next instant as he started up from his chair. He never got to his feet. Instead, he shut up like a jackknife and went down on the floor with a blow over the head from a revolver butt that knocked him senseless. It all happened in a second. But in that second, Lee got it with more vividness than a thousand hours would have given him, 
the great hulking figure, the water trickling to the floor in little pools from the dripping clothes, the sickly pallor of the face, the thin new skin of the livid scar across the cheek, the sightless eye. Clancy. Lee couldn't have lain unconscious more than twenty minutes. Perhaps it was only fifteen. For it takes about forty minutes to climb the four miles of the slide, you see. Call it twenty, and that allows for what happened before and what happened after. When he came to his senses, the light in the bracket lamp was out, blown out by the draft, for the door was open. A stray beam or two from the pusher's headlight filled the caboose with an uncertain, wavering light from the jolt and swing, you know, though Lee thought at first it was his head. He tried to get up, but he couldn't move. He was bound, hand and foot laid out on the flat of his back, helpless. For a minute he was too dazed to understand. Then he remembered, Clancy. He stared up into the cupola above him. The swivel chair was empty. Pearlie had gone. The car trucks were beating a steady clack, clack, clack as they pounded the fish plates. From behind came the full, deep-chested thunder of the trailer's exhaust. Around the hundred noises of the creaking, groaning, swaying car. Without the patter of rain, the wail of wind. But over it all, low though it was, came a sound that sent a chill to Lee's heart. It was like a breathless moan, do you understand? That was the inhuman part of it. It was breathless. There was no break, a sort of sobbing monotone. It came from behind him. Lee shivered as he listened, and then his heart began to pound as though it would burst. He was afraid. Afraid? Premonition, perhaps. I don't know. He rolled himself over on his side, and he saw... How can I tell it? A figure was crouched against the side of the car in half-sitting posture. The face was red, red with the blood that was flowing from the forehead. Lee shrieked aloud in terror, pearly, pearly. Then he grew sick with the horror that was on him. Worse than murder, the half-breed had threatened, and he had kept his word. Pearly had been scalped. Lee's cry must have reached the poor wretch's consciousness, for he staggered to his feet, sweeping his eyes clear with both hands. Lee, sick to the depths of his soul, the sweat breaking out in great cold drops upon his forehead, fought like a maniac with his bonds. Pearly never spoke, never paid any attention to Lee. He was past all that. But his brain, at least, was still capable of coherent impression. It must have been to account for what he did. Right in front of him, as he hung there tottering and swaying, was a broken bit of mirror tacked up on the side of the car. He was staring into it. His moaning stopped. The shock of his own awful horror must have revolted, shaken his very being. His hand groped weakly, subconsciously, perhaps, for his pocket, his revolver, the end. Again Lee shrieked as he struggled to free himself, and then, as Pearly fired, he burst into a peal of wild, discordant laughter. His mind was giving way. He began to gibber like a madman. That's the way they found him, with Pearly's body pitched full across his chest. Don't ask me. I told you Pearly was a little undersized, sawed-off man. I don't know, do you? The half-breed physically could have handled him like a baby once he caught him unawares. That's all I know. They buried Pearlie down at Big Cloud, and they buried Clancy where the posse dropped him, drilled full of holes. That's the story. Lee? Charlie Lee? Why, he doesn't count, does he? He had nothing to do with it. Well, if you're interested in him, I'll tell you. His college diploma never did him any good. Once he got better and out of the hospital, he took to drinking periodically, hard. Between times, straight as a string, you understand, for six weeks, say, then off again. That was fifteen years ago, and he's done it ever since. The doctors said that blow on the head unsettled him, skull splinter or something like that. But medicine's not an exact science. The doctors were wrong. The trouble was deeper than the skull. It was in his soul. Lee drank to save himself from the madhouse. I told you, didn't I, that some drink because they have to. Carlton, the super, and the men before Carlton understood what the doctors didn't. So Lee's working for the railroad yet, not breaking. He's not fit for that. 
but he keeps the job they gave him and it's kept for him when he gets back after his spells I... there's a foreman shouting at me sorry but i gotta go if you're going out on number one she's just coming down the gorge now good night sir i lost him in the shadows of the big mogul on the pit behind me then i turned and walked slowly out of the roundhouse over the turntable and across the tracks to the station platform number one's mellow chime floated down from the gorge then the flare of the electric headlight and the rumble of the train and in quick fierce tempo the beating drumming trucks caught up the name i had heard the foreman shout and rang it over and over again in my ears oh you lee charlie lee lee charlie lee end of chapter ten